Well, good morning again, church. It's uh, always a unique blessing to, for us, sit in the front row of the services because we have the opportunity to hear the praises of the people of God in unison being lifted up to the Lord as sweet aroma. And there's nothing like gathering with the people of God, singing praises to his name. And as we continue our worship this morning, let us prepare our hearts for worship in the word. Can we pray? Uh, Father, we rejoice and we celebrate that we serve a living God. We thank you for Christ and him crucified. Uh, Father, this morning as we transition our worship to your word, we pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the truth therein. We pray that your word would, as it said in the word, is, is sharper than any two-edged sword, would uh, uh, speak to our hearts, would identify areas that we need to change or shift, and that your spirit would guide and direct us in light of it. So, Father, this morning, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And who we are not in Christ, we ask that you'd make us, and we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, many of you know my wife and I, we have three kids, and our youngest, he recently hit the six-month mark, and so whenever someone reaches six months, they always want them to go in for their six-month checkup at the doctor's office, and the purpose of that checkup is in order to monitor his growth and his development. They want to make sure that he's uh, meeting certain marks of maturity. They, they want to make sure that he's developing as he should. And so some of the things they checked up was they checked his, his, his weight, checked the length of his body. They also checked the circumference of his head. <laughs> it's funny because they'll give you a report of how he's growing and developing in comparison to others. But beyond that, they also have a conversation with us about one of the marks of maturity or marks of development at six months is that they can now eat solid foods. And so they had a conversation with us about introducing him to solid foods. And we had actually already done that. And about a week prior, we, uh, uh, my wife, she went out and she bought some baby food, you know, and we popped it open. It was sweet potatoes. And I'll tell you this, out of all the markers of development, this is one of my favorites, you know, as they get to eat for the first time, it's always exciting. And so we got a spoonful of that sweet potatoes and, and we, we touched it to this little guy's lips. And he was sucking on a little bit saying, what is that? And then he opened his mouth a little bit and we, we popped it in and it began, uh, he began to taste it for the first time. And boy, that boy's face lit up. <laughs> His eyebrows were raised, and with each subsequent uh, um, a, a, a spoonful of food, that boy opened his mouth wider and wider. He was basically telling us, give me more, and don't you dare hold back. And it's such a joy for us as parents. But not only that, he has two older sisters, and so we've got a three- and a five-year-old, and our three-year-old, she likes to play airplane with it, you know, as she gets to feed him. And she's as coordinated as a three-year-old is, and he's bobbing his head trying to get the food, and it's just a mess. But it's an incredible, fun thing to watch your children grow and watch your ch children develop. It's a delight to watch them mature and reach those developmental markers. And I can't help but think, how much more is it pleasing to our Heavenly Father? When he watch, watches his children grow spiritually, watches them develop spiritually, and watches them con being conformed into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. This morning, as we open up the word, I want to take some time to do a spiritual checkup with you. You know, the truth of the matter is, whenever you open up the word, whether individually or corporately as we're gathered here together, you're always doing a spiritual checkup. But I want to do a spiritual checkup with you this morning in light of God's word to take some time to talk about how you and I are growing spiritually and how we are developing spiritually. The unfortunate, the unfortunate thing about it is this, there are too many Christians who find themselves growing older without ever growing up. And there's a difference between the two. It's one thing to grow older. It's another thing to grow up and to mature in the faith. And sometimes you talk to individuals who will tell you, I've been a Christian for five years or 
I've been a Christian for 15 years, or other people would say, I'm a Christian for 50 years, and sometimes you want to ask them, then why do you still act like an infant in the faith? You know, this morning, I want to take some time uh, to talk about the, the, the marks of the blessed life, the marks that help us monitor our spiritual maturity and our spiritual development. And I invite you to do that with me in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 8 to 12 together. As you make your way there in your Bibles, as we've been walking through 1 Peter, Peter is writing to a people who are experiencing the pressures of persecution. When this is written, history tells us things are not going to get progressively better. Things are going to get progressively worse. And the timing in which they need this message as we do now is now. And so as they receive this message, Peter has been writing to encourage them, to remind them of their identity in Christ, to remind them of what it means to be a a part of the church. They are living stones connected to the living stone who is Christ the Lord. And then in chapter 2, he reminded them as pilgrims and sojourners, they have a testimony to share before an unbelieving world, and he instructed godly servants and godly citizens and godly wives and even godly husbands. And as he continues to give instructions, he reminds these believers in light of their heavenly citizenship, they've got some earthly responsibilities and what we get to read about responsibility-wise. All believers, these are the marks of maturity. These are the marks of the blessed life that provide us the ability to monitor our spiritual growth and our spiritual development. So as we open up the word, would you stand in honor of the reading of it? 1 Peter chapter 3 beginning in verse 8 and following. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. And the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The word of the Lord, y'all may be seated in the presence of God this morning. As uh, we have an opportunity this morning to uh, walk through our text, we're going to take some time to talk about the marks of uh, the blessed life, the kind of marks that help us monitor our spiritual growth and our spiritual development. And the first mark that we read about in verse 8 is our attitude towards fellow believers. If you want to know if your spiritual growth has been stunted or your spiritual growth is developing as it should, consider your attitude towards fellow believers in the local church. Consider your attitude towards fellow members of the local body of Christ and consider your attitude towards even the leaders of the church whom God has appointed in the church. And often that's a good sign of where you're at spiritually speaking, whether your spiritual growth has been stunted or you're spiritually developing as you should. And so Peter writes this in verse 8. He says, finally, all of you, and he gives a list of adjectives, five adjectives in the Greek that d- d- describe and characterize the attitude we should have as believers one to another. Let me go ahead and read them. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be be courteous. Now, as we take a look at these five adjectives in just a moment, I want to talk about how Peter introduces these five adjectives that should characterize our attitude as believers one to another. And he begins with the word finally. The word finally doesn't introduce us to the conclusion of the letter. Rather, it introduces us to the conclusion of the current section we're in. That current section began in chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, and each week we take time to review that. In verse 11, Peter referred to these believers who feel the pressures of persecution as pilgrims and sojourners. He lets them know, I understand you guys are, and you guys need to understand that you're temporary residents just passing through. 
You are in the world, but you're not of the world, and you have a heavenly citizenship that you should stay focused on, but as you are in the world, you have some earthly responsibilities that you are to maintain. And in chapter 2, verse 12, that, that, that earthly responsibility is to share your testimony of faith before an unbelieving world. And so he began and he spoke to godly citizens. He spoke to specific groups within the church. And so if you're an earthly citizen, this is his encouragement. You shine your light of faith before an unbelieving world by your submission to authorities in the government. He then spoke in chapter 2, verse 18 to godly servants. He says, you share your testimony of faith before an unbelieving world as you submit to authorities in the workplace, as you submit to your master's. In chapter 3, he spoke to the wives and he said, you share your testimony of faith before an unbelieving world by your submission to your own husbands and you even share your testimony of faith before your unbelieving husband as you submit to him. And then we heard about the husbands. They were also given instructions that they are to lovingly lead their wives and to understand their wives, dwell with them in an understanding way. And that, that's their means of sharing their faith before an unbelieving world. And having spoken to these specific groups within the body, he now says, finally, all of you. The word all there in the Greek means all. So when we're talking about finally all of you, he's speaking to all believers in the body. And so he introduces us to these five adjectives that should characterize the attitude we should exhibit one to another. He says, finally, all of you be of one mind. To be of one mind means to pursue harmony in the local church. To be of one mind can be better translated to be like-minded. Now, when we're talking about being of one mind, we're not talking about pursuing uniformity. We're talking about pursuing unity. Uniformity is thinking alike, looking alike, and doing everything alike. And, and so what we're talking about, what it means to be one-minded, means that what unites us as believers is stronger than the differences that may divide us. As believers who are gathered here this morning, we're reminded that there, we come from diverse backgrounds and we come from a different uh, diversity of ages and stages. And one unique thing about Twin Rivers that I've observed, and I'm sure you have as well, is we are a multi-generational church. You have different people within the church at different ages or stages. You have infants all the way to those who are in their 90s and beyond and so we are a multi-generational church and with multiple generations comes multiple opinions and differences of doing things but we're reminded this morning that what unites us we'll talk about that in a moment is stronger than the differences that may divide us even in regards to our age or our stage we're reminded that many or some of us come from different nationalities. I'm half Filipino. I'm half Lithuanian. My wife is Cambodian. Some of you come from different backgrounds and nationalities as well. But we're reminded this morning to be of one mind, to be like-minded, means that what unites us is stronger than the differences that may divide us. You may have been raised in a different church than the church that I was raised in, but we're reminded the, the, the thing that unites us is stronger than the differences that may divide us. So what is the thing that keeps us like-minded? How do we pursue unity in the face of diversity? What does it look like to maintain harmony within the body when we are so much different one from another? First, we're, we're reminded that which unites us is our common profession of faith in Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. When you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, you don't just have God as your heavenly Father now, but you also have a family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so what we're reminded is what unites us is our common profession of faith in Jesus. Now, uh, sometimes you run into individuals who have similar vocabulary as you when it comes to what it, when you, what it means to be a Christian. And so I wanna give you seven questions you can ask anybody to determine whether they are a believer or not. These are helpful questions, and these may be helpful questions for you this morning because these are the questions, in the manner you answer them, we want to be aligned with you 
on each of them. The first question is this, do you believe in the biblical teaching of the Trinity? Do you believe the biblical teaching of the Trinity that the one true God exists as three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? These three are one in essence, distinct in person, and equal in glory. Do you believe in the biblical teaching of the Trinity? The second question is, do you believe in the full deity and humanity of Jesus Christ? That when Jesus left heaven for earth and was born in a manger, he was fully man and fully God, deity wrapped in humanity. Thirdly, do you believe in the spiritual lostness of humanity? Do you believe that when you and I are born into this world, we are born spiritually separated from a holy God? We are born broken. We are born sinful. Each of us are born with a deep-rooted evil, even the best of us in each of our hearts, and it expresses itself in all kinds of ugly ways in our attitudes, actions, and affections. Do you believe in the spiritual lostness of humanity? Fourthly, do you believe in the substitutionary atonement and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and, the Bible, and what the Bible teaches about that? Jesus was born in a manger in order to die on a cross, and the reason he went to a cross was not to bear his own sins or pay the debt that he owed, but to bear our sins and to pay our debt, to be our substitute. And three days after defeating sin, death, and Satan on the cross, he was raised in newness of life, ratifying what he had done three days Prior, do you believe in the substitutionary atonement and bodily resurrection of Christ? Fifth, do you believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 is very clear on this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. And then do you believe in the physical return of Christ who's coming back again in glory? And then the seventh question is this, do you believe in the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture? This morning, I'd like to suggest if you answered no to any of those questions in regards to the Bible's teaching on them, you are probably not a Christian. If you answered yes to those seven questions, I would suggest you are. As believers, we need to know what unites us, and it's our common profession of faith in Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. The second thing that unites us that's stronger than the differences that divide us is our common purpose in the faith. As believers and as Christians, we're reminded in Matthew 28, 19 to 20 that our call and our purpose is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things I've taught you, Jesus says, and lo, I'm with you to the end of the age, Acts 1, 8, puts it this way, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. What unites us is our common purpose. We've been called to go and we've been called to make disciples and what unites us in our common profession of faith in Jesus. What unites us in regards to our common purpose in going and making disciples of all nations is stronger than the differences that may divide us. So Peter begins and says this, be of one mind. But secondly, as we continue, it says, be of one mind. Secondly, having compassion for one another. In the Greek there, the, the word that we get is the word we get sympathy from. So a better translation I'd suggest is the word sympathy. And that Greek term literally means to share the feelings of another, to share the feelings of a fellow believer. Different scriptures help us understand what it means to be sympathetic to fellow believers. Romans 12, 15 says this, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Do you share the feelings of fellow believers? 
when they lose a loved one, when they're experiencing hardship, when they've entered into a crossroads in their life and they don't know if they are going to turn left or they don't know if they are going to turn right, are you with them in the midst of the struggle? You may not know exactly how they are feeling, but you weep with those who weep and you rejoice with those who rejoice. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26 describes the church as a body. It says, if any one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. To be sympathetic to fellow believers is to see yourself as a body. Among us are different members, and when one part suffers, we all suffer. Now, there are some parts of the body that are more visible than others, but there are also parts of the body that you don't see. If they suffer, especially those major organs, the whole body goes down. There's something wrong with your kidneys. There's something wrong with your heart. There's something wrong with your lungs. The whole body suffers, but even when it comes to that little pinky toe, there are times you stub that little thing and I will tell you the whole body suffers when one part of the body suffers to be sympathetic towards one another is to suffer as well. And when one part of the body rejoices or is honored, we all rejoice as a body. So the, 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 the adjective that should characterize our attitude is that of being like-minded, being of one mind, pursuing harmony, is sympathy. And then thirdly, brotherly love. It says, love as brothers. Brotherly love is more than just calling so-and-so brother or sister. It's talking about treating one another and loving one another as if you're part of the same family. The interesting thing about being a part of a family is you don't choose the family you're born into. But nevertheless, your family. And you may not always get along with your fellow family members, but you certainly can't get away from them because they're your family. We're reminded if we're going to love as brothers, if we're going to love as fellow family members, we stick with each other in good times, but we stick with each other also in difficult times. Why? Because we're to love one another with a brotherly love. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1-2, to 2, Paul instructed uh, Timothy to treat those in the church as family. He said, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. So the way we are to treat one another is as family. Those who are older than you, treat them as you would an older individual within the family. Those who are younger than you, men and women, you are to treat them as your brothers and sisters in Christ. We get to read about this brotherly love throughout 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, if you just... Go back a verse. It says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Chapter 2, verse 17, it said this, Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Love one another as if they're family. That is what God has designed us to do. And some of you may say this morning, well, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ sometimes don't treat me like family or have not in the past treated like me like family in the local church. But uh, the way that you're called to love your family is not dependent on how they treat you, but how you treat them. It's unconditional. So regardless of how your brothers or sisters in Christ treat you, you are to treat them as family and to love them as brothers and sisters in Christ. I would like to suggest this morning to love one another as family means that you don't compromise two things. You, you don't compromise teaching truth, but you also don't compromise in loving well. They, they go hand in hand. And so when it comes to God's word, we need to be discerning. We need to talk to one another and encourage one another. And when we see something out of alignment in, in another person's life and they're on a path of destruction that could ultimately lead to death, we should talk to them and confront them in the, with the word of God and speech, speak truth. We don't compromise the truth of God's word. We follow what Matthew 18 clearly teaches, but we also do so in love. And sometimes 
When it comes to brotherly love, we read about the steps of what it means to confront sin in the local church or someone who has committed an offense against me and we go to them and we talk with them and we confront them with the word of God and say, what do you think about this? And sometimes we don't give them enough time to allow the Holy Spirit and the word of God to begin to convict their hearts so that they could repent of the sin and we move forward with the next steps. When we're going to treat others with brotherly love, we teach the truth, but we love well, and there's a process by which we patiently wait on the Holy Spirit to work with the word in the heart of that individual, convict them, and bring them back to the truth. Even that last step you see in Matthew 18 where you you treat an individual in the church who is unrepentant as an unbeliever. The purpose is not just to mistreat them or to remove them from the body, but is in order to reconcile them so that they would see what life is like apart from Christ and his people and that they would be so broken over it, they would come to a place of repentance and they would once again be reconciled to Christ and reconciled to fellow believers. Teach truth, share the truth, but love well. And so brotherly love should uh, be that which characterizes our attitudes. And then as we continue to be tender-hearted, tender-hearted, it says, love as brothers, be tender-hearted. The word for tender-hearted in the Greek, the root word there in the Greek is the bowels. You know, whenever you feel anxious, worried, stressed, overwhelmed, often you feel, feel it right there, right, in your stomach. Uh, back then, they, they used to think that the seat of the emotions was not in the mind, but was in the bowels. And so when it speaks of being tender-hearted towards fellow believers and allowing this to characterize our attitude towards fellow believers. We're talking about a deep emotion for fellow believers and being stirred to love and compassion. I'd like to suggest in the original Greek, when you take a look at in verse 8, it says, having compassion for one another. That's better translated sympathy. But here, when it speaks of being tender-hearted, tender-hearted could be better translated compassion. And the manner in which I would I would uh, tell the difference between sympathy and compassion is sympathy is feeling what the other person feels, rejoicing with those who rejoice, weeping with those who weep. And I would say compassion goes one step further in regard to being tender-hearted, and it's being stirred and moved to action. You see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It says, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And so you are so moved by your heart for them that you are even willing to forgive them. Compassion goes further than feeling bad for them. It's being moved to action on their behalf. The kind of love that Christ has for us is not just one where he looks at sinful humanity in their state of depravity and sees them unable to save themselves, destined for hell and in eternity without God and his people forever and looks at these poor individuals and says, I feel bad for you. I feel for you. I feel the pain of your circumstance. No, he doesn't just respond with sympathy. He responds with compassion. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Us. He was moved to action. The Father sent the Son to be born in a manger, to die on a cross, to be our substitute, and to bear our sins that we might receive forgiveness and everlasting life. Be tender hearted towards one another. Now, we're talking about all believers here, but we've just been talking in the first seven verses about married couples. We talked about the marks of a godly wife and we talked about the marks of a godly husband in verse 7. How much more should we within the body be treating our wives or our husbands with the same attitudes? How much more should we be tender hearted and moved to forgiveness when they sin against us? How much more should we treat them as brothers and sisters in Christ? How much more should we be sympathetic and feel what they feel, rejoice when they rejoice and weep when they weep? How much more should we exercise in a moment we're going to see 
humility or courtesy in relationship to them as well. To be of one mind. We're on the same page. We're on the same team. And then the last one, of course, that which should characterize our attitude is that of courtesy. I'd like to suggest a better translation is humility. What is courtesy? Courtesy is the way we think about it is opening the door for somebody, allowing them to go before you. But the idea here is treating others better than yourself. The idea is thinking of yourself modesty, modestly and walking in humility. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4 says this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's what trips us up at times. But in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than himself. So have, a, 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 have the right view of yourself and treat others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not at... Not, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Then you go into 5, 5 to 11, right? And that's talking about the example of Christ. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Christ is our ultimate example of humility. And when others mistreat us, as we're going to see even in a moment, we don't mistreat them back. We bless them. We do good to them. Because our example is Christ. And through the work of the Word and the Spirit in the, of the, in the heart, God begins to change us and transform us and allow us to adopt the kind of attitude we've been called to exhibit with fellow believers in Christ. So the first mark of a blessed life, and I describe blessing. If you're a blessed individual, you are a recipient of God's divine favor over your life. The first mark of a blessed life that helps us monitor our spiritual growth and development is our attitude towards fellow believers in the local church. That includes members and that includes leadership in the local body. And so this morning, I have to ask you this question. You know your heart, and you know your relationship to fellow believers in the church. You know your relationship and your attitude towards the leadership of the church. You know your attitude towards your closest neighbor in the church, the ones you live with. Let me ask you, where are you at in your spiritual growth and development? What areas do you need to grow and develop in? Do you, do you need to be like-minded do you need to be of one mind pursuing harmony? Is it brotherly love and treating one another as family? Is, is it sympathy and feeling what other, others feel? Or, or am I too focused on myself and my needs that I don't take time to learn about what the needs of the rest of the body are? Do I just show sympathy to others or am I moved to action on the behalf of another and truly love them as God calls me to love them? And, and do I walk in humility following the example of Christ who, who made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of, the, of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and humbling himself even to the point of death on the cross. Christ did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What an example for us as followers of Christ to follow. If I could give us some next steps for us as we consider where we're at in our spiritual growth and development, I, I hope all of you can see we have a ways to grow. We have a, a ways to develop and to mature spiritually. We like to think, hey, I'm, I'm, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. But as we walk through these attitudes, there are areas of growth that God still needs to work on our hearts in regards to, to them. Uh, the first step in your spiritual growth process, of course, is, is first accepting Christ as your Savior and your Lord. You cannot grow spiritually because you are not spiritual until you are born again. You know, there's a lot of individuals in our culture, you talk to them all the time in our day and age, and they will tell you, I'm a, I'm a spiritual person. They'll tell you they're spiritual because they pray or they meditate. The reality is, if you don't have the Spirit of God in your life, you are spiritually dead. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
of God. To be born again means that you recognize your need for Christ. You admit your sin. You admit your brokenness. You admit that you are spiritually separated from a holy God. You are not a friend of God. You are an enemy of God. But you also admit that Jesus is your only solution. That Jesus came from heaven to earth to die on a cross, to be your substitute, to forgive your sins, and to grant you everlasting life. When you put your hope in him, when you put your faith in him, when you place your trust in him, when you follow him and him alone, you become born again. And so the first step is being born again. Uh, The second step is continuing to get connected into a church community. It's important to be a part of a a local church. It's important to be around fellow believers in Christ, to be of one mind with them, to exercise sympathy, to to be uh, those who who love as brothers and sisters in Christ, to be tenderhearted, to walk in humility, to love as we've been called to love, to have the kind of attitude we've been called called to have, and and if I could just give us some practical ways to do that, the first one is check your attitude towards fellow members and leadership in the church. Check your attitude. What's your attitude like to to, to fellow believers in the local? What is your attitude towards leadership in the church, pastors and elders in the church? As you check that, the second thing is, is make weekend and midweek gatherings a priority. If you're a part of a family, you... You gather with your family on a regular occasion. And I'm not saying you have to come every Wednesday, but maybe Sunday, that's an essential thing. Meet with your family once a week at least. It's a good thing to meet with the family of God. You don't just come here because, uh, because it's encouraging, even though that's part of it. You don't just come here to see so-and-so or, or to talk with so-and-so, even though that's part of it. You come here to worship the God who created heaven and earth and provided salvation through his son and to gather with your family. You make it a priority every week. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were out at a conference and then Sunday came and uh, the Saturday before, on the weekend, we went to an amusement park before and, and when, uh, my brother had come down with us in, while we were in California and uh, we... We're seeing how long our kids could make it, you know. They start to get tired around 7 p.m., 8 p.m. The amusement park doesn't close till midnight, and they're saying, hey, how long do we stay tonight, you know? How long do we enjoy our time together? I said, we can go as long as you guys want, as long as we make it to church in the morning. (laughs) Church is a priority. We're going to gather with the people of God. Even when it's not our local church, we want to make the gathering of the people of God a priority. Uh, thirdly, commit yourself to uh, a small group. You know, it's one thing to meet together on a Sunday morning. It's another thing to have conversations that are a bit more transparent and accountability in a circle of those you get to know weekly. And so commit yourself to a, a small group. Fourthly, uh, join the membership of a local church. Now, as I say that, I say that from a place of love Because I don't just say join the membership of our church, but join the membership of a local church. And a lot of folks ask the question, does membership really matter? And I would like to suggest three things in regards to Scripture into why membership matters. First, membership matters because of unity. Membership matters because of unity. As we just talked about in our text, and as you see in Philippians verses, chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, unity matters. We want to know that you and I are believers moving in the same direction, united by our common profession of faith, united by a common purpose in mind. We want to be moving in the same direction with the people of God who believe what we believe. Not just unity, but service. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, Christ, he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Who are the ones who are to equip you? You don't know who's, who are those who are going to equip you if you're not a member of the local church. And whether membership is formal or informal, membership is a necessary biblical thing that we see in Scripture. Not just unity and service, but also accountability. Matthew 18, Hebrews, 
uh, Hebrews, let me get it right. Hebrews 13, verse 17. It says, obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch over your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Can I ask you, how do you know who you are to be accountable to or who you are accountable for in regards to Matthew 18 if you are not a part of a membership of a local body, whether it's formal or informal? When you obey Hebrews 13, verse 17, who, how do you know which elders to submit yourself under? Are we to submit ourselves to just any and all elders in the Springfield area or the Lane County area? Certainly not. We need to know who we are to be submissive under and how much more for the elders and the responsibility they have to watch over the souls of the people of God, knowing that elders and pastors were going to give a greater account before the Lord, it's helpful to know who's in the body and who's not. Who we are accountable for and those we are not accountable for because we're going to give an account before the Lord. Membership does matter biblically. And so join the membership of a local church. And then... Lastly, if I could encourage us in this, repent of that which is stunting your spiritual growth. There's some things that stunt our spiritual growth in our relationship and our attitude towards fellow believers. The first one is pride. Prideful individuals are self-seeking who demand their own way and don't take others into consideration in getting their way. It's my way or the highway. We're not working in harmony. We're going to go about accomplishing what I want and not what the what is best for the whole body. Secondly, impatience. Impatience. I talked about this earlier. Give people time to grow spiritually and don't try to be the Holy Spirit in the life of others in the church. You can pray for them. You can encourage them. You can confront them with the word of God as we should in relationship to Matthew 18. But you cannot take the Bible, hit it over their head and hope that they are going to change their heart. Only God can do that. And allow the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit. This is always helpful in regards to marriage. You can pray for your spouse. You can encourage your spouse. You can read verses to your spouse. You can lead them in a devotional and a prayer. But in the end, the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to change and transform their heart. Don't try to play the Holy Spirit even in your spouse's life or your spouse's heart. That includes your children as well. And that reminds us of how dependent we truly are on the Lord. How much we need to express our dependence through prayer as we seek Him to accomplish His purposes in our lives and those whom we are praying for. But thirdly, that which we need to repent of, that stunt spiritual growth, is unforgiveness, bitterness, and hatred. We're reminded this morning that we're not going to pretend that you've never been hurt by the local church in any particular way. You may not be able to control how people mistreat you in the local church. You may not be able to control a fellow member of the church criticizing you, a leader of the church disappointing you, another member of the church doing something to stab you in the back, but you can't control how you respond to them and how you respond to it. We are to respond with forgiveness we're not to respond with bitterness and allow that bitterness to take root in our hearts and breed dissension within the local body, but we are to pursue forgiveness. And we can't do that in the flesh. We do that by following the Spirit, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, another thing we need to repent of is apathy towards the needs of fellow believers. I don't really care about what you're going through because I had a hard week. Apathy will stunt your spiritual growth. And then lastly, I'd, I always like to put holy huddles in there. You know, we as churches tend to think that we are the most friendliest church in the, in the world because we meet each other, we see each other, we're excited on Sunday morning, but at times we get so excited to, to see our fellow believers that we fail to, to meet with other people on a Sunday morning, other fellow believers that we haven't met. Sometimes it's good to shift your seat around and move from one place in the church to another to get to know other people within the local body. And so well, what are the, the marks of the blessed life that help us um, monitor our spiritual growth and development, our attitude towards fellow believers. Secondly, in verse 9, 
our attitude towards mistreatment and insults. Our attitude towards mistreatment and insults. Now when you read verse 8, you know that we're talking about how you relate to fellow believers. But when you read verse 9, after reading verse 8, the expectation is verse 9 is not speaking of believers. Verse 9 seems to be speaking of unbelievers because believers should not be the type who mistreat you, revile you, or insult you. But nevertheless, I would say verse 9 is speaking not just of unbelievers, but believers alike. And one way that we can monitor our spiritual growth and development is how we respond to mistreatment and insults inside and outside of the local church. Let's go ahead and read that. Verse 9 says this, Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. The content of the command is this, Do not repay evil for evil. We see that all throughout Scripture, right? And there's a reason why we see that again and again throughout Scripture. Christ is our example who did not repay evil for evil. The reason that's there is because we have a natural bent in our flesh to respond to evil with evil. (laughs) We have a natural, natural bent within our flesh to respond to insults with insult. You know, you might be driving down the road driving down the highway, enjoying yourself, singing praise songs to the Lord, and then all of a sudden someone cuts you off, you have to step on your brakes, and your first reaction is usually not in the spirit where you want to pray for their salvation and ask the Lord to bless them. Your first response is often in the flesh. I don't know about you. I know, uh, I know me because when someone honks at me, I want to honk back at them. There is a natural tendency within our flesh to repay evil for evil and insult with insult. Romans 12, 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Back to 1 Peter 2, verse verse 23. Jesus is our example. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Repay no one evil for evil, insult for insult. Instead, repay evil and insult with blessing. Now, this is easier said than done. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And this is a reminder, if you are walking in the flesh, you cannot fulfill that which we've been called to do here. We need the work of the Spirit and the work of the Word sanctifying our hearts as we are conformed into the likeness of Christ, depending on Him moment by moment and day by day. The word blessing there in the Greek is where we get the English term eulogy. It means to speak well of another. And so when we're talking about speaking well of another, instead of insulting them, instead of doing evil to them, we speak well of them. We desire for them to be blessed. What does it mean for them to be blessed? I said earlier to be recipients of God's favor. And so when someone does evil to you or when someone insults you in the spirit, through the work of the word and the spirit in the heart who's changing and transforming you, what you do is you pray for that individual. You ask the Lord to give you a heart that is sympathetic and compassionate to their current state. You don't just pray for them. You pray for their salvation. You you pray that they would experience God's salvific work in their life and they would receive Christ as their Savior and Lord and be a fellow brother or sister in Christ. I will tell you, that is not easy in the flesh. But we're not called to do it in the flesh. We're called to do it in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 to 18, I say then walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now we're talking about our testimony of faith before an unbelieving world. What an amazing thing when we've had friends who are in the world with us, and they're still in the world, and you've trusted in Christ as your Savior and Lord, and they've seen how you've reacted to those who have committed evil against you in the past. They've seen how you've treated those who have insulted you in the past. But when you respond to insult, when you respond to injury with blessing, they say to themselves, I don't know what's going on with him or her, but God is doing something in their heart and something 
in their life. What a testimony of faith that you have when you respond with blessing instead of reviling for reviling or evil for evil. And then we see the motivation for it. Uh, verse, nine, verse 9 continues, knowing that you were called to this. This is speaking of our call by the Father to receive his amazing grace and his salvation that you may inherit a blessing. You respond with a blessing in order that you might inherit a blessing. What blessing are we talking about? What inheritance are we discussing? Go back to chapter one, verse three. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse four, to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Why can you respond to evil and insult with blessing? Because you're just a temporary resident passing through. Because you are in the world, but not of the world. You are a heavenly citizen, and you've got some earthly responsibilities to share your testimony of faith before unbelievers all around you. And suffering may get worse. It may intensify. And for those Peter is writing to, the pressures of persecution continue to grow stronger. But they, in the face of the pressures of persecution, can trust in the hope that this life and the current suffering doesn't compare to the eternal glory of heaven. Temporary pain, eternal glory and joy forever and ever. And so verse 9 concludes with the motivation that you may inherit a blessing. And so this morning I'd like to invite us not just to consider our attitude towards fellow believers but our attitude towards those who mistreat us and those who insult us because our natural response will tell us or our response will tell us where we're at in our spiritual growth and our spiritual development. I know I have a ways to grow. The first step is to admit your need. This morning I'd invite us to confess our, confess our fleshly tendencies. Lord, when my spouse speaks to me this way, I know what my natural reaction is. Lord, when I'm in the workplace and uh, when this person does that or says that or, you know, speaks to me and, and he acts like he's, he, he's giving me a compliment, but really he's criticizing me. Lord, I know my natural reaction. But Lord, as I confess my fleshly tendencies, allow me to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Confess your fleshly tendencies. Secondly, ask God to help you endure evil and insults with patience and grace. If you experienced problems yesterday and you know you're going to experience problems today, you better start your day on your knees. Asking God to help you endure with grace and patience. And then thirdly, ask God to help you follow Christ's example. Fix your eyes on Christ and him crucified. Follow his example. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11 serve as such a great example for us. So the marks of a blessed life that help us monitor our spiritual growth and development, our attitudes toward fellow believers, our attitude and our response to those who mistreat us and insult us. And thirdly, our attitude towards life in difficult times. If you want to know if you're growing spiritually or where you're at in your spiritual development, consider how you respond to life in difficult times because the invitation in regards to a spiritually mature believer, the mark of maturity of a believer is to enjoy life even in difficult times. You know, Peter now says four, and it's an explanation of how and why you can respond with blessing to those who revile you, insult you, and do evil to you. And he quotes Psalm 34 here. 
He quotes a psalm written by David, and we're reminded that David wasn't experiencing easy times. He was experiencing difficult times, but he still invites the reader to join him to enjoy life, to love life, and to experience good days. If you take time to read Psalm 34, you'll read that David describes his fears in verse 4. He describes his troubles in verse 6 and 17 of Psalm 34. He describes his afflictions in verse 19. And he describes his broken heart in verse 18. But in the midst of the difficulty, his eyes were fixed on the Lord. And so the invitation of our text is to pursue the mark of maturity and the mark of a blessed life, which is to enjoy life, to love life, and to experience good days even in difficult times. And Peter, quoting David, tells us how. He begins and he says, for he who would love life and see good days. To love life and see good days means to enjoy it. You may be facing the most difficult of times, But what we're reminded of, what David knew, is that enjoying life and loving life and experiencing good days is not dependent on the absence of pain and is not dependent on the absence of problems. It's dependent on the presence of God. It doesn't matter what's going wrong as long as you know who's in control. And so it says this, first he must control his tongue. You want to enjoy life? Control your tongue text says here, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. You know, if, if you think about your tongue, the tongue is small, Scripture often refers to it, but it's often deadly. Gossip is like a, a little fire that can spread like wild fire. If you want to control your tongue, there's some helpful text in Scripture. Uh, if you have trouble controlling your tongue and... Most of us would say, yes, we do. Especially when we find ourselves in difficult times. I'd give you two anecdotes. The first one is to read James 3 on a regular basis and would be to memorize Psalm 141.3. Let me read Psalm 141.3 to us. It says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Father, protect what comes out of this mouth because I know my tongue can be deadly. If you flip back a couple pages to James chapter 3, let me read it. It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive the stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits into horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look at also at the ships, although they are so large and driven by four fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, whoever the pilot, wherever the pilot desires. Even the so, so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how a great forest, a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevine, bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. You know, there's a saying that goes, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. And as you rely on the Lord to guard your mouth, to guard your tongue, it's better to hear and listen more than you speak. There have been a number of occasions, I'm sure, you yourself or been in a conversation with another when they've said, you know, I probably shouldn't say this. Well, don't say it. And you may in your flesh not be able to hold back on that, but through the Holy Spirit, you indeed can. So control your tongue. Control your tongue. Guard against... uh, speaking deceitful words. And then secondly, uh, um, 
uh, per, uh, pers- uh, turn away from evil. It says, verse 11, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. So turn away from evil. Uh, that's what repentance means. Repentance means to change your mind that leads to a changed direction. If there is any kind of evil in your life, the, the, the encouragement is don't walk that same path you once walked. If you know it, when you turn on the television that you're going to be tempted towards evil, don't turn on the television. If you know your cell phone is a cause for iniquity and sin in your life and a cause for temptation, get rid of your cell phone. If you know if you take a certain path or a certain road home or you're around certain people and they bring out you, and you to gossip about this or to gossip about that, cut those people out of your life. Get serious about sin to the point you say, I'm going to turn my back to it and walk towards the way of the Lord. So turn from evil. Turn to Christ. Follow after him. Pursue peace. As you pursue peace, you follow what God has called us to in regards to our relationships with fellow believers, but also in the world. We, we, we speak up for truth. We are discerning, but when we can pursue peace, we pursue peace in, in all ways. As we continue to read, it also says, um, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. And here's the reason why. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. This is the encouragement. This is the Why should you control your tongue? Why should you turn from evil and pursue peace? It tells us God is watching you. And when it talks about God watching us as those who are under the shepherd's care, we don't have to fear. We have a reason to rejoice because with ears he hears the prayers of his people. And so this is really an encouragement to you who walk in righteousness, who control your tongue, who turn your back towards evil, and you pursue peace. You don't revile those who revile you. You don't insult those who insult you. You don't repay evil for evil. The Lord is watching you, and he hears your prayers, and he answers according to his will. But this is the warning. It says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You may be a believer and you may be a Christian, but when you walk a path of sin, the Bible is very clear in regards to our text, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I don't want God to be my foe. I want him to be my friend. Continue to control your tongue through the power of the Spirit who resides in you. Continue to turn your back to evil. Continue to pursue peace. Continue to shine a light of faith before an unbelieving world by not responding in the flesh, but rather walking in the spirit and enjoy that which God brings the blessing when it comes. There's a, there's a saying that goes that children say, bricks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But then you grow up and you learn that bricks and stones hurt in places bricks can't get to. Guard your tongue. For those who are married in the room, those who have children in the home or even outside of the home, guard your tongue. For those in the local church, when you're having conversations with others and you say, I know I shouldn't say it, don't say it. Walk in the spirit, turn your back to evil and then enjoy the blessed life. Enjoy the favor of God. The blessed life doesn't begin after we die and Spend eternity with God and his people forever. It begins now. John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and may have it in abundance. The abundant life is all about finding contentment in the care of your shepherd. Can I invite us this morning? May we seek refuge under his care. Are you facing difficult times? Are you facing hard times? The invitation is to love life and enjoy your days even in difficult times because of God who is watching over you. Can we pray? Um, Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for the, these reminders in your word. And as we come together and come to a spiritual checkup in light of the text, uh, Father, there are ways that we need to grow. In regards to our attitude towards fellow believers, our attitude towards those who mistreat us or insult us, our attitude towards life in difficult times, 
And Father, you know how difficult it can be to grow and to mature, and we experience growing pains, but we also know, Lord, the work that you began in your life, you are going, that you began in our lives, you are going to bring to completion. And we are being conformed into the likeness of Christ moment by moment and day by day. And so, Father, we want to begin this morning in thanking you for giving us the faith that we have to trust in you as our Savior and Lord. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins we have in Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. And thank you for the promise of the inheritance of heaven that we will receive as we pass through this life into the next. Father, if there's here someone who would say, I am broken, I am in need of salvation, I am in need of forgiveness of sin, I pray that they can express this in their hearts or out loud as I share as well in a genuine manner. Father, I need you. I need you in my life. I need God in my life. I need Christ in my life. I need the Holy Spirit in my life. Father, I admit this morning that I was born into this world sinful and separated from you, a holy God. And I also admit that Jesus is the only solution. I believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he left heaven for earth, died on a, left heaven for earth, died on a cross to bear my sins and to grant me everlasting life. I receive that forgiveness of sins. I trust in Christ as my Savior and my Lord, the one I will follow all the days of my life into eternity. Father, we pray that these marks of the blessed life and these marks of, the mat of maturity would be that which marks our lives this week and in the weeks to come. We pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.